Hear the words of our God. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why don't you grab the hand of the person next to you and say, neighbor, today, with God's help and your prayers, the preacher's going to preach about, let it go. Amen. Let it go. Why don't you turn to your other neighbor and say, neighbor, let it go. Now, why don't you point to yourself and say, self, let it go. Amen, amen. Anybody knows me knows that I really love going to Walmart. Amen, amen. I love going to Walmart because you see all kinds of things at Walmart. There's everything at Walmart. You can see all kinds of stuff at Walmart. But particularly when I go to Walmart, I go into the grocery section because there are certain items that I like to have. Recently, during the break, I went into Walmart, walked through the aisles, found some ice cream, found some pop cereal, found just about everything that I like to literally snack on. I purchased my items, y'all. I was excited about it. We even tempted to open stuff up before I got to the checkout aisle. I'm walking through, and I noticed that in all the aisles during the break, that all of the aisles were full. But there was one particular aisle that was moving pretty fast, and that was the 15 items or less. Y'all, I walked over to the 15 items or less, looked down in my basket, and figured that I had just enough to make it to 15 items or less. I waited in line for about seven minutes, and after seven minutes, the young lady said, sir, can I help you? I said, yes, started piling my things on the conveyor belt, excited about my ice cream, excited about my pop cereal, and I was ready to eat my Snickers. And she started running things and checking them out one after the next, and then finally she stopped with one item. That one item was my Coca-Cola six-pack, y'all. I was excited because it was cold, and I was ready to drink my Coca-Cola. And she said, sir, you have one item over 15 items or less. Y'all, I waited in line seven minutes. I'm like, ma'am, you mean to tell me you would hold up the line? for one item and it's 16 items. She said, sir, the sign says 15 items or less. Y'all, I was getting ready to cut up. Yes, the preacher, because I had waited seven minutes and you gonna hold me up for one item. Y'all, I was angry, frustrated because it was my Coca-Cola. But the young lady looked at me with a smug face, folded her arms and said, why don't you just exclude something, sir? And it would be down to 15 items and I can check you out and get the folk behind you. Y'all, I was pretty upset. I said, how dare you get a manager because you gonna check me out with this one item. I mean, one item over, 15 items or less, the manager comes down and said, sir, what's the problem? I said, sir, I got one item. The line was building up. One man hollered out, man, would you just go on? And y'all, I'm holding the line up because in my mind, all it really took was her to scan this one item, one nobody gonna know but me and her, and I'd be able to get to the house with my 16 items. But y'all, I found out something that day. They were not willing to, even though I had perused Walmart pretty much the last eight or nine years, even though all of the cashiers knew me by name, they would not go over the requirement of 15 items or less. But what I figured out about myself was that I could not let go of none of the items that were in my basket because I was holding on to them with dear life. As I got into the car, I never did get that other item, but as I got into the car and started driving off, y'all, I was fuming. I was upset because they were holding me 
up with one item. As I got home, and I always do, I started processing the reality of what had happened at Walmart. I started thinking to myself that spiritually in 2016, as I crossed over into 2017, there are a whole lot of items on my checklist that I felt that I really had to have. And the reality was that God was trying to show me that there are so many things that the people of God hold on to that God simply wants us to let go. But the reality is that we look at life through a dark lens and never really see that the things that we hold on to, God is literally trying to get us to get rid of. And the reality in my life was that there are some hate, there are some frustration, there are some agitation that I've been holding on to for years and God is simply saying to me that you really need to let it go. And I know that there are those of you who showed up this morning with a smile on your face, you excited about 2017, but here you are on the second Sunday of the new year and you're still holding on to some stuff that God said that you ought to let go. You may be mad at somebody, hating on somebody, mad at someone, jealous about something, frustrated about your finding. They've been talking about you, but whatever it is, you need to come to the reality that if you want what God has for you, you got to learn how to let some stuff go. And I know everybody ain't going to say amen because you want folk to think that you got it all together. But the reality is that every morning we wake up, we're frustrated about something. We're agonizing about something. And the reality is the reason why a whole lot of us can open up our mouths and tell God thank you is because we're holding on to some stuff that God already delivered us from. And there ought to be some folk in here that could testify that you're holding on to some stuff that you really know that God intended for you to let go. And so it is in our text this morning that the Bible helps us to understand that Jesus Christ breaks forth into the history of humanity to help us to appreciate that we can come to him with all of our burdens, all of our labors to know that he's able to deal with all of our frustrations. The Bible says that as we look at the occasion of this text, that Jesus comes to literally deal with the address the people who were burdened and weighed down with the legalism of the Pharisees. In the midst of the legalism of the Pharisees, Jesus simply says to come. It expresses the comparison or the compassion of the Christ towards the oppressed people. He literally says, in spite of where you've been, in spite of what you've gone through, that God is enough God that he invites you to literally come. And I really like that because it shows me that in spite of what I've done, in spite of where I've been, that God get, gets into loving relationship with me and he literally invites me to come to him. And that ought to be good news for us to know that Jesus Christ says that we can come to him and whatever we're dealing with, we can turn it over to Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad to know that I serve a God who's big enough that whatever situation I'm dealing with, he's not intimidated by my problems because he simply says that I ought to come. And one of the reasons why many of us can't seem to get over some stuff is because Jesus has given us a loving invitation over 2,000 years ago that bids us to come to him, but a whole lot of us turn over our problems to everybody else and we charge God foolishly when and he doesn't deal with our circumstances. But can I tell you something? You don't have enough friends that could take care of your problem. You don't have enough resources that could deal with your issues. And Jesus simply says that you ought to come. But not only does he say that you ought to come, but he says, come unto me. I like that because Jesus says to the, those who are going through the struggles of life that the Pharisees have talked about you. The Pharisees have caused you to live under a heavy yoke that you couldn't handle by yourself. And Jesus says to them in the midst of their condition that you can come
come unto me. Don't go to neighbors, don't go to friends, don't go to family members, but literally come to me, which means that Jesus is not intimidated by our problems. Whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're going through, God is simply saying that I'm enough God that I can deal with your circumstances and handle your problems. And what I, might I submit to you this morning that one of the problems with a whole lot of Christians is that we have short-term memory. Because the reality is that if God dealt with some stuff last year, what is it for God to deal with some stuff this year. I mean, you lost the job last year, but you didn't miss a meal. I mean, you was catching Metro last year, but you still got to work. I mean, they said they weren't going to fool with you, but God kept waking you up every morning. What is it in your life that God is not big enough to deal with? And they should have been a big amen somewhere right around there because there's a whole lot of us who know what it is to bring your problems and your burdens to Jesus because he knows how to handle your circumstances the Bible says that Jesus says come unto me and I like that because the required to follow the body or the obey the laws of the land but but Jesus says in the midst of the laws that the Pharisees had set before you he acknowledged the fact that they could not follow the law because the law left them where it found them the Bible teaches us in the Old Testament that the different sects of religions in the Jewish uh, temple at that time had written some 660 seven laws or one laws and they added it to what they call the Decalogue. Jesus, the Lord God, had given them the Ten Commandments and the priests and the scribes had written some 600 additional laws and they were holding the people under the law of the land and saying to them that if you want to get close to God, you got to follow all 600 and something of these laws. And if you want to get close to God and see God move in your life, you have to follow the laws. And if you follow the laws, you can even get close to us. Come here, friend, child of God. Can I help you with something? What I love about God is that even though I may be frail, even though I may mess up, even though I may not follow his word like I ought to, he still bids me to come. And that ought to be good news to somebody here today to know that in my failures it does not fracture my relationship that God knows that in the midst of what we're going through that we can never ever ascribe to hold up to the law but what I thank God for is that he gives me grace and when he says come unto me he simply says that my grace is sufficient enough that in your fault in your failure in your faults that I'm enough God that my grace can cover a multitude of sin and let me just stick a pin right there and say to somebody here today I know you've been in church a long time I know you got your shout on cue I know you know how to dress right appropriately for church but if the truth be told all of us are mess ups and the reality is that God keeps bidding us to come God keeps allowing us to show up every morning in spite of what we are and what we've done to show us that it's by his grace and his mercy alone. The Bible says that he says to them, come unto me. But he also says, ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I like that because he shares with us what I like to call cause and effect. He shows us that the cause for all of the burdens that mankind deals with is that we are heavy laden. In other words, he acknowledges the fact that the Jews had put such a burden on them to follow the law, that they were showing up to the temple so burdened spiritually and so burdened emotionally that they could not worship and praise their God. And might I submit this morning that there are a whole lot of us who show up to the temple every Sunday and we're burdened with the issues of life. If I could grab a quote from M. Scott Peck in his book entitled, The Road Less Travel, he simply said that in this life there will be trouble. And the reality is that trouble shows up even when you don't call it or send it an invitation. You just have a way around in the corner and there it is. And Jesus says that it is the burdens of life 
that press us down. If it's not one thing, it's another. And when I was a young boy, I would hear my mother and grandmother in them say stuff like, if it's not one thing, it's another. If, as soon as you get one thing fixed, something else breaks down. And now that I'm on this side of life and have my own family, I'm a living witness that you fix one thing and then another child act up. You fix one situation and another situation act up. But thanks be unto God that he says we can come unto him. It means that every burden I have, God says that I can rest it at his feet. But not only does he talk about that we can come unto him all, ye that labor and are heavy laden, but he says to us that I will give you rest. He gives us cause, he gives us effect, which is that we labor and that we toil. But he gives us an answer that you can't get anywhere else. He says that I will give you rest. And I don't know about you, but there are some things in life that I wish to God that he'd give me rest. There are some things that I'm just tired of dealing with, and I need God to give me rest. There are some folk that I'm tired of dealing with that I wish that God would just give me rest. And I know I'm not in here by myself, but there are some issues that I wish that I didn't have to deal with and that God would just give me some rest. And I know there's some folk who showed up this morning and you're tired of dealing with some stuff. You're tired of dealing with some foolishness. You're tired of dealing with financial difficulties. Tired of dealing with wayward children. Tired of dealing with backbiting saints. Tired of dealing with foolishness over and over and over again. But thanks be unto God. He says that I will give you rest. And somebody ought to shout glory to God today. Because in the midst of your frustration, God says that I will give you rest. And y'all I don't know about you but Hennessy and Coke can't fix this because you need God to give you street west. Uh, you, you can't take a sip of this and a smoke of that because it only lasts for a little while but thanks be unto God that God knows how to give you sweet rest and I wish to God I had a few saints that don't mind testifying that God knows how to give you sweet rest because baby I'm resting right now. Can't you see me? I showed up to church with praise on my lips and a thank you Jesus in my heart because he's worthy somebody shout he's worthy he's a worthy God in the midst of what I'm going through but not only that watch this y'all he says in verse number 29 take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls I love, I love the analogy, the illustration that Jesus gives because he simply says, take my yoke upon you. In other words, he uses this farming terminology. He says uh, he uses a yoke because if you know anything about farming, you know that a yoke is a wooden pulley. And what it does is it yokes two animals together and there's a harness on it. And what it does is it's utilized to put two animals together to pull weight. And Jesus says that ultimately that I want you to take my yoke upon you. He simply says that I will harness you with me. In other words, it's like a advanced or more experienced ox taking on a young bullock. And what farmers would do in the Old Testament is that they would take a young bullock and they would take an older ox and they would train them by yoking them together. The young bullock was wild and out of place and had a tendency to get out of line. And so what he would do is yoke the young bullock with an older ox who was experienced tilling the ground who knew how to stay in line, who knew the particulars of fielding the ground. And Jesus says that I will yoke you with me because I understand that in your infancy, I understand that in your flesh that you get out of line, but I'm going to yoke you with me so that you won't do certain stuff that you used to do. And see, you can tell real closely when folk are yoked with God because there's certain things that you just won't do. There's certain things that you just won't say because you've been yoked with him. And when you get too far out of line, he knows how to reel you back in. And there ought to be some saints in here that don't mind testifying that you're glad that God knows how to yoke you with him. 
<laughs> but watch this now. Watch this. Here's the shout in the text. He simply says that take my yoke upon you and watch this and learn of me. Let the church say learn of me. When, a yo when they are yoked together, an ox and a bullock, the responsibility now is that when this young bullock is tied with this seasoned ox, he takes him through the field and every time he gets out of line, he's pulled back in because the yoke won't let him go too far. But the other reality is that when he stays yoked up with him long enough, he starts learning how to stay in line. And what God says to us is that when we stay yoked in his word, he knows how to keep us in line. And when we stay with him long enough, we know how to walk the straight and narrow. And there ought to be some witnesses here today that don't mind testifying that you've seen your walk change because you've been yoked with God. You've seen some stuff that you used to do that you don't do no more. You used to could cuss with the best of them, but because you've been yoked with God, you know how to bridle your tongue. And because you've been yoked with God, you don't fight like you used to fight. Because you've been yoked with God, you don't do some of that underhanded stuff like you used to do. Because you've been yoked with God, you don't dip and slip like you used to dip and slip. But because now you've been yoked with God. Is there anybody here that can testify that you have been yoked with God? But not only does he talk about this whole movement of being yoked upon you and learn of me, but it carries the idea of mimicking what you see. Because not only is the young bullock responsible for watching and learning, but he's also responsible for mimicking what he sees. And what Jesus says to this young group of body of believers is that they were mimicking what they could not mimic because every time they got to the standard, the Pharisees kept adding another rope for them to jump over. And Jesus says to them that I want you not to learn from them because they hating on you. They will never let you be what you could be. But he says, what I want you to do is pay attention to me because I am in John 10 and 10, the good shepherd. And I want you to understand that when I lead you, I know how to lead you in the right direction. He says, not only do I know how to lead you in the right direction, but Jesus says that when you follow me, I'm demonstrating for you how to walk the right kind of walk. And when you see it enough, you learn how to walk the right way. And the reality is of the text is that one of the great tragedies of our local assembly is that we have so many people who are trying to clone and mimic the wrong kind of folk. We got so many people in the contemporary church who are trying to make disciples unto themselves. And Jesus Christ says that if we are to follow him, we have the responsibility to mimic what he does. And Jesus says to these disciples and to you and me that we ought to be very careful not to mimic the world. And let me just put a clause here to the second Sunday since I'm talking to not only parents but also youth. One of the realities of our youth today and the demise of our children today is that we're not putting adequate role models before them. But rather, we are allowing them to follow role models who don't mean them no good. You following folk like 2 chains and folk who rapping and talking foolishness and all of this nonsense and jumbo mumbo. And I'm not trying to rob you of your fun. But what I am trying to tell you is that there ought to be some folk that you mimic who are living a lifestyle indicative of somebody who loves Jesus Christ. And let me just put a little pause in here or clause in here for some of us parents today that have children who don't even want to mimic us. Because the reality is that they know how we act at church. Amen. But they know how we act at home. And so a whole lot of what our children are representing in the school system and tearing up the schools has a whole lot to do with what they see at home. And if you want your children to live right, we got to learn how to be consistent at home. See, it's one thing to show consistency at church, but it's another thing to show consistency at home. 
And I argue that one of the reasons why our generation is going through what they're going through is because we're leading them in the wrong direction, not from church, but at home. And the reality is that they know real good how to count backwards, which means that you better quit telling them that y'all was married before they were born because children know how to count. Amen, lights and cameras. So Jesus says that we ought to mimic, but not that, but watch this. He says, for I am meek and lowly of heart. He says, I am meek, but he also says that I am lowly of heart. He says, take my loke upon you and learn from me, but he also says that I am meek and lowly of heart. And I really like that because Jesus shares with us the ultimate characteristic of a divine teacher. He says to us in this text that we can bring all of our burdens to him, we can come to him, but he also tells us why we can come to him. He says we can come to him as the ultimate teacher. We can come to him because he's not like any other teacher. Because if the truth be told this morning, teachers who in the academic field can sometimes get bougie and upright and start thinking like they got it all together because the Bible says that knowledge puffs up. And Jesus was dealing with what was going on in the culture because the Pharisees started thinking that they were so academically sharp that nobody could be on the same level that they be in. And the reality was that they were denigrating the results of what was going on with the Jews in the culture. And so now Jesus speaks to this issue. He speaks to this problem and he simply says that I'm not like them. My characteristics are different than theirs are. I am lowly uh, in heart and I am meek. And he says to them that you shall find rest. And the best way to articulate this for you, I'm reminded on my way to my seat, uh, for all through high school, me and my best friend had always had the same classes. But there was one class, Cortez, that we did not have together, and that was math. And uh, one year I decided that I would go to him and let's compare report cards. I was feeling mighty puffed up, Joe. I was feeling like I had arrived because I wasn't taking basic math. I was taking trigonometry and I was feeling pretty good about myself. And so I wanted to go show him what my grades were. I wanted to go show him what my math grades were. And my friend messed me up for the rest of my life. I, I went to him and showed him what my grades were. And I was like, man, let me see your report card. And he pulls out his report card and I noticed in the math section that he did not have the same kind of math that everybody else had. But in his report card line, it said remedial math. Y'all, I leaned back because I, in my mind, started thinking that he was taking an elementary kind of math. But before I could start laughing and joking about him taking a less math, uh, Deacon Jones, than what I took, he, he said to me, he said, man, uh, I don't know if you know this, but I have a learning disability. I don't learn like everybody else learns. I don't pick stuff up like everybody else picks stuff up. So I have to go into a special classroom because the classroom that I have, there's only about nine or 10 people. Uh, the class that you have has about 30 or 35 people. Y'all go at a faster pace. Uh, I have to go at a slower pace because I am in remedial math and I have a learning disability. Don't hang up on me yet because I'm going somewhere. He, he, he's, he's taking remedial math. He's in a slower pace class. He said, they got to take me in a room sometime and explain it to me three and four times because sometime I don't get it like everybody else gets it. And y'all, the Lord starts speaking to me because what Jesus was saying in the text, he was simply saying when he said that I am lowly of heart and that I am meek and that I am a kind teacher. He was saying that most of us, if we're honest about it, we've been on remedial Christianity for a long time. And if we're honest about it, we don't always get the same stuff right all the time and that we slip up and mess up over and over and over again. And every now and then, 
God got to take us in a special class. And he has to sit us down and give us chance after chance after chance to get it right. Okay, y'all miss y'all shouting cute. I know you want to act like you got it all together, but the reality is that all of us have been in some remedial class for some sin because the reality is we keep telling God, God, I ain't going to do it no more. Lord, I won't fall into that no more. But here I am the next morning saying, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And so I don't know about you this morning, but I thank God that I can let it go because I have a Savior who promised me that he'll never leave me nor will he forsake me and if you believe that this morning you ought to wave your hand and tell God thank you because you got a savior who will never leave you nor will he forsake you Jesus told us that I am lowly but he says not only that but he says that I am meek and he says that I am lowly in heart and that you will find rest unto your soul but he also says for my yoke is easy but he also says, child of God, that we might uh, understand that my burden is light. And what I like about the yoking between an ox and a bullock, if you know anything about the yoking, you'll understand that when you see uh, the elder ox carrying the load and you see the young bullock tied to him, it looks as though they're both carrying the same load. But the reality is that that's not the story and that's not how it ends. Because when you understand anything about the training that goes on between an ox and a bullock, you understand that most of the load is placed on the ox and not on the bullock, which means that the young ox is only carrying what he can handle. But the bulk of the weight is on the ox's shoulders, and the young bullock may look as though he's stout and he can handle the load. But what happens is that it is not evenly distributed, but what happens is that the ox is carrying all of the weight. And what Jesus Christ is saying to you and me today is that you don't have to carry all the weight by yourself. That Jesus Christ will carry the load and you don't have to carry it all by yourself. Okay, I see how y'all looking at me. Okay, let me do it this way. Uh, uh, when I first started uh, lifting weights in the eighth grade, we went in and started lifting weights, and I was all excited but a little nervous and anxious uh, about lifting weights, Deacon Miller, and I, I got in there in the weight room, and the coaches were like, man, you get up under there. I was skinny and frail, about a buck oh five, and they wanted us to lift weights, and I'm looking at these weights, and I'm like, man, this ain't going to be good, and y'all, I got under the weight bench, and my teammates started laughing and joking and harassing me because I could not lift 135 pounds out of the rack. And y'all, they were laughing at me, but my coach did something that I'll never forget. He eased up behind the weight bench, y'all, and said, Andre, push that thing out with all of your strength. And y'all, I was pushing that thing out with my eyes closed, and all of a sudden, what I couldn't lift, all of a sudden, I was lifting, y'all. And all of a sudden, I did one down, and I was pushing with all of my weight and it just seemed as though I could not get the weight up but all of a sudden I started feeling my help coming and I was able to start lifting the weight uh, as though I had strength that I know I did not have and my coach looked up at me and looked down at me and I opened up my eyes and to my amazement he was doing something that I had never seen before he said man I'm spotting you because I know this is a weight that you can't lift by yourself and I'm trying to help somebody today to understand that in 2017 that we got a spotter that knows how to lift the weight when you can't lift the weight and there ought to be some witnesses here today that don't mind testifying that all of 2016 when you couldn't lift it by yourself that God kept spotting you God kept lifting it God kept lifting you to a high level and all I'm trying to tell somebody in 2017 that if he spotted you last year come on turn to your neighbor and say neighbor he'll spot you this year turn to somebody else and say neighbor my God will spot you he will look out for you. He will keep you. Somebody shout glory. He's worthy to be praised. Let it go. Trust God. Depend on God. Depend upon his word. Last year for some of you was a detrimental year. 
It was a challenging year. It was a frustrating year. You lost loved ones. Some of you lost jobs. Some of you lost support. Some of you lost friends. Some of you had to deal with financial issues. And the reality is that you've been holding on to it for a long time. Mad at the world. Mad at God. Mad at family members who promised that they wouldn't leave you by yourself. And the reality is that you showed up this year and you promised that you weren't going to trust and depend on nobody else. And for some of you, if you're honest about it, you even questioned your relationship with God. But I stopped by long enough this morning to help you to appreciate that God says that you could come unto him, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And he promises that I will give you rest. You can trust God. Because he can handle all of your problems. He can handle all of your situations. You don't have to carry that burden all by yourself. I know they talked about you. I know they promised you some things and it didn't come through for you. And you came through for everybody else. But when your need came, nobody was there for you. But I want you to know that he promised that he's a friend that sticks closer than any brother. And if you trust in him, he promises that he'll never let you down. And so there's somebody here today by way of prayer, and you acknowledge the fact that you've been holding on to some stuff. You've been lingering with some things. You've been holding on to some hate, some frustration, some animosity because of maybe what they said to you, maybe what they said about you. Maybe it's been some issues with your family members and you guys haven't talked for an awfully long time. But you realize that you don't have to hold on to this thing not another day. You don't have to hold on to the burden by yourself. Because Jesus Christ, by his word, he simply says that you could take his yoke because it's lighter than yours. And so today you realize that you've been holding on to a heavy burden and you want to release it. So as the encouragers stand with me, if you're here today by way of prayer, if you're here today by way of of relationship with God, if you're here today by way of fellowship with God, I want you to get up in the aisle and I want you to make your way. 